already recording anyway. <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah, let's so, go. So anyway, Lear, thanks for jumping on the show, man. We appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Already, like we talked before this a little bit, and we got we got some stuff to get into for sure. Now that you filled us in on some details, but just for um, listeners, go ahead and like introduce yourself, your band, um, you know what you do in the band, that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm Lear. I am the singer guitarist of Some Days Are Darker, uh, which essentially is like a, I guess I call it a goth rock project at this point, because it's the easiest way to give someone a range of what it is. Slightly post-punkish, probably not as dark wave as uh, some of the stuff that's a little more electronic, because we're we present more like a band. So I kind of say it's like somewhere between him and The Cure or somewhere in there. Usually they brought it goes, up right oh, okay. away. Yep. We were Dude. we were wondering <laughs> if you were gonna bring up him or not. Cause like oh, hell yeah. I was yeah. like, man, it sounds like a lot like it. Like it's hard to not you can't deny it no matter what way you cut it. Um Oh no, the, I wouldn't deny it. The electronic album, like of the remixes that you guys have, sound nothing like it. So I thought right. that was really cool because like when I first heard the first single, because Ramona brought the band up to us. Yeah. And um, I think she like told you about us as well. And then when I checked out the first single, I was like, oh, this sounds a lot like him. Told Jeremy about it. Then we got busy and got sidetracked or whatever and went back to it. Yeah. But then when I went to the electronic album, I was like, damn, this is nothing like it. Like this is more along the lines of Sisters of Mercy and that sort of thing with the electronic instrumentation. Yeah, um, for us, like Depeche Mode also was a huge influence yeah. when we did the remixes of like where we wanted it to land. It's interesting because like this whole Some Days Are Darker just started as like a singer guitarist thing. Like I was just going to do it solo at first because I didn't have a band and I didn't know what I was going to do with it really. Um, but then it, eventually I got bandmates involved, so it became more of a band. Now it's a three piece band. So it's guitar, vocals, bass, drums, and we run a little bit of backing. Um, but it, you know, that is like how it presents now. So it kind of evolved from being a lot mellower singer songwriter almost. And to, by the time we did the first LP, it sounds more like a full band, but there's still a few acoustic songs in there with, you know, no drumming and shit like that. And then, um, when we did the, wh what we found was once we started playing shows, there's so much dark wave. And especially in Phoenix, LA, like Vegas, some of the places we played here, like San Diego on the West Coast, a lot of times when you book a band, like if it's post-punk or dark wave or somewhere in that realm, you're kind of always drawing the same people out. They're the people that like him and The Cure and Sisters and Depeche Mode and Joy Division. And it's all those same people. But a lot of the times we were playing with bands that were like two people. It would be like an electronics person and a singer. Right, or they like, don't have that full band. Yeah, yeah. Or like backing tracks and a singer. Or one guitarist and a keyboardist or whatever. So it was like much more dark wave. You're getting a lot more like dark wave duos. And so when we did the remixes, we were like, well, what if we just take some of the songs we already have and just like we do all our own production up to this point. So we're like, what if we just remix our own stuff a little bit? And the goal was also to get some other friends and other bands involved in the remixes because that always just kind of helps mm -hmm. um we've actually been trying to get remixes of other bands that we could do as inferno choir but inferno choir is basically the name of the label that i started for some days are darker just to put out all my stuff and my back catalog in that so when we did the remix project we did two uh inferno choir remixes which were just me and robbie um from some days are darker just going like how how depeche mode can we push this you know and that's yeah. what we do with Nocturne. and then uh and sisters is like probably my favorite band of all time but maybe only second to depeche mode so it's like i'm a singer guitarist but i'm influenced by a lot of electronic music yeah um and then we did the lost days what well, before you get to song. that sorry to interrupt you oh yeah i wanted yeah, to sure. ask this since you brought up sisters because i'll forget maybe okay <laughs> yes let's park so on that if you had to pick between sisters of mercy and the mission which would you choose well i would easily choose sisters yeah okay i i yeah. go to sisters very easily i um I have like a weird loyalty complex to singers or especially <laughs> yeah. like 
it's it's probably a flaw or something I need to you know, work through in therapy. But like most bands that are like kind of like run by the singer, for lack of a better term, at that break up and then the band goes and does something else. I always just prefer like I prefer um, Peter Murphy to Love and Rockets. Right. But I'd rather I than be Bauhaus. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. But if I have to pick now, there's two bands. I kind of like, I kind of, and, and you hear that a lot where it's like, the singer's an egomaniac and we can't work with them anymore. And so the band goes and does something else and ends up being cool. Um, but I, I that you know, egomaniac's I would, art, though, is good. Isn't that, isn't that the case, you know? I know. And like, I, sometimes there's a reason for the ego. So, and it, okay, in the sister argument in the mission, which is obviously what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, Wayne Hussey, in his own right, could is his, has his own ego, and it you know the mission's so fucking good, dude. And the See, mission's like, great, you know, I not often, to take anything away from it. I agree with you. Like I'm kind of the same way. If a band goes and switches singers or a crucial member, like I often prefer the original. And in that case, I still would. But in that specific case, like I mean, to me, they're almost neck and neck. Like they're two great bands yeah. two with great bands similarities yeah. I, I hate to have to choose but yeah. if i have to i will <laughs> right 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 yeah. had under to the ask, head so. it's fucking it's sisters i had to ask because we were talking about yeah. that yesterday and i was like any sisters of mercies fan i always um i always ask that just out of curiosity because i do know some people that prefer the mission to sisters yeah i mean you know I, anybody uh, that prefers new order to joy division not off the top of my head, but me if you either. gave me a minute, I Only could Only because find we brought up, this, no, brought up the same thing, and that would be, yeah. you know, it's like the singer left, but they changed, you know, changed the name, different band, singer left. And I and I love both bands, but I'd pick Joy Division without thinking twice, you know? Same. And I, I recently had that conversation with a friend of mine, and I said, you know, I, I kind of realized as we were talking through it, like, maybe Joy Division just got too fucking dark. And by the time Ian Curtis took his own life, you know, that might be part of the reason that New Order is a little more optimistic at times. Like, sure, they have, you know, Blue Monday and they have some sadness, some darkness to it. But it definitely they definitely did a shift yeah, when they dude. lost Curtis. And I, I think maybe they it just makes me wonder if they just, you know, things got a little too dark for them for a while. I think the music along with the suicide happening probably they wanted to just they're like we're getting away from yeah. this i really want to the catch second lp up. is like very dark you see i think it's even like harder to get through than the first one for joy oh, division yeah definitely with joy atmosphere division, yeah. yeah 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 ceremony so record but yeah. uh so did for... you guys watch the uh uh george michael documentary recently the Netflix one, I think it was last year. No, I added it to my list because somebody, I can't think of who off the top of my head, somebody was telling me about it and they're like, it's yeah. actually really fucking cool. Like, I'm like, yeah, I would watch it, but I just never it's got cool. around and it. There's, they show uh, some interview footage of him, like when he used to sit on those goofy English like pop shows with like Morrissey and George Michael sitting on the couch talking about current events and stuff. He brought up uh, the second Joy Division record um, is that what it's called? What's the white record called? Closer. Closer, closer yeah. yeah. Closer. He, is closer? it closer or closer? Closer. C-L-O-S-E-R. They're spelled the same way, though. Which is also their closer. Closer. Um, oh, yeah. Close. And he had mentioned that he, he was on this pop show just talking about like that he thought it was a brilliant record and he liked it better than their first record. And I thought that was interesting because like George Michael also got for a pop star it got pretty dark, had some pretty dark moments musically. Um, but to go back to sisters, if you don't mind. Yeah, go don't ahead. mind. Picture, picture this, <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite sisters record is the first one. And it's because I love the instrumentation so much. Like I love the 12 string guitar and like kind of jangly elements. I don't know, there's just something very bleak about that one. And so I have to give credit to the whole band and Hussey and everybody for being on that record, right? But imagine, you're Eldridge and your band's like, fuck you. You're too hard to work with. We're out of here and we're going to go start something else. And then you're like, okay, fine. I'm going to write another record by myself. And you fucking write Floodland. Yeah. That's my favorite Dude, one. That's like, 
that's two middle fingers to everyone that I'm gonna, said you I'm going to fill the gap thing. here and Vision <laughs> Thing is my favorite sister's record. Dude, Vision Thing's fucking awesome. I know they're so all so good. So yeah, then he has the Floodland era. A bad one, but yeah, that is yeah, the ultimate he, like fuck you guys. Then he's working with Patricia Morrison. He's got some other bandmates coming in and out. Then Patricia's like, "Oh, he's hard to work with. He never pays me." I'm sure he was hard to work with, and I doubt he paid her. Then he fucking writes a vision thing, dude. Yeah. It's like just three just all-time great records in a row. Boom, yeah. boom, boom. And the fact that he never put anything else out, I'm like, I don't know, man. It's probably for the best. It's like, it's probably for the best that Caius never put another record out, right? It's just the perfect legacy. Yeah. yeah, like you didn't have the time to put out that dreaded fourth or fifth album that's going to be like you your sh- Yeah, you didn't have time sound. to put out like... Danzig five or six. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Or Danzig <laughs> Stop six. Stop how Elvis. the God kills. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's what I think about sisters. It's like, man, the, he was like unstoppable. It didn't matter who he was working with. So obviously that was a big influence on you then, especially being sort of Andrew moving on to being a one man band essentially later on in his career. And actually it kind of started out that way a little bit too, where, because yeah, we, we both read um, Paint My Name in Black and Gold, the book, which was actually, I don't remember the name of the guy that wrote it, but you need an editor, dude. Um, I'm not. Was it rough? <laughs> it was, it's yeah, just there's a rough. better one out there. Yeah, Jeremy has a better one. What's the name of it? I can't uh, remember. I'll have to... But it was rough, like, in the sense of there's like 20 guys named John in the book. And also, he doesn't, like, Andrew Eldridge goes from being called Andy to Taylor to Eldridge to Andrew to, and like, it just bounces around so much. And I'm like, dude, just pick a name and run with it. And it just felt like it repeated the same story over and over again. And there was literally a paragraph this big on Vision Thing, and that was it. Oh, weird. The book you want to read is Waiting for Another War. Oh, yeah, that's right. I knew the name. See, in a weird way, it's like, I don't know if I want to read all that. I don't know how much I want to know about how fucked up. Oh, yeah, I got you. You know what I mean? Well, we're just, we're who we are, and we're nerds, so we want to know everything. (laughs) Like, sometimes I don't want to peel back the curtain in some ways, but I will admit this. Uh, I was very bored, like, a year or two ago. I don't remember the context, but for some reason, I spent, like, a week reading every single link at the bottom of sisters of mercy's wikipedia because all the citations were like these super old pubs that are like archived and like jpegs of news articles from the uk and shit like that and i learned a lot of really fucking weird stuff about what was going on in that era like reading a lot of old eldritch interviews from from like first and second record era and it it was super interesting so like shit uh, would, that he would talk about, like the environment around him, things of that nature, or like the, just the times and shit. Yeah, the times, the band, like uh, what uh, what drugs he's taking at the time, and you know the interviewers talking about how strung out he looks, and just like all kinds of different lots and weird lots shit. And lots like, of speed. Yeah, preparing yeah, lots preparing of for speed. war definitely <laughs> definitely tells speed you drum machines. Yeah. But um, that's fucking cool. That's a hell of a rabbit hole to go down. Yeah, it was it was pretty fun, and like similarly because we brought up him earlier, um, that was a band for me. Like uh, I got into them on Razorblade Romance, like in a huge way, and that's still my definitely my favorite him record. Yep, I Us agree. Um, yeah, I think it's perfect, but um, I think it's perfect musically for them for what they do. It's a perfect album, and I think the just the look like. I know people who just saw that album cover in a store and bought it just because the fucking vibe was just like nothing else at the time. And um, I just think they nailed that whole aesthetic, the logo, everything they're doing was super cool. The lyrics were great. And I, I didn't know wonder for... if they th- thought that logo was going to become as big as it did, Dude. because for a while, like it was huge. Yeah. And I, I always feel like the him logo is the logo. I wish I would have fucking drew because I feel like that thing just took off like wildfire, but it's so perfect for that band, the love metal thing. And it's if you the can get and to, the tat- to tattoo it, you're fucking golden, dude. Oh, hell yeah. You're making a killing. Plus, you'd be a pretty rich dude by now for how many times that thing's been licensed and sold. You would hell think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. doesn't, doesn't Bam own it? 
Like, or does Vil, Vil Valor own it? I can't remember which one of them, but... I am unsure. I thought, I thought Bam owned the something to do with the band, a share, or a stake, or maybe he was mm. just like a super fucking mega fan. I don't remember, but I know he was... Yeah. He had a hand in it growing as popular as it did. For sure. I couldn't speak to the legality of it, but... Yeah, I don't know um, for sure either. Yeah, and I think where I was going with that too is just that... I didn't realize at first that him was a singer songwriter band. Like, I mean, I think that dude Valo just, these are all like his riffs, his lyrics, mostly yeah. his songs, but they present as a band. I always thought of him as a band, like five guys going in the jam room and being like, Hey, check out this riff. But I really think it's most likely, especially with what he's doing now, a band where he's like, okay, guys, here are the songs. Well, I and you know, of course, the guy's putting his leads on or adding his own keyboard parts or whatever. But like there's more bands than I realize as I get older, the more I realize how many bands are kind of like run by one primary songwriter. Yeah. I think it's a lot more rare to have like a band where there's equal input from every musician, which if you have that, it's awesome. I mean, I think uh, I've, I've definitely had a range of that in the bands I've worked on, but like, yeah, I think there's there's more of that than you realize. And that all goes back to like, usually when a band breaks up, I kind of side most of the time, I think, with the singer songwriter or the primary songwriter. Even if like the primary songwriter is a guitarist that gets kicked out of the band, the band's going to sound different after that. So it's like, for sure. Yeah, it's like, a, I mean, I, I'm a big Nails fan and I really love the Todd Jones era terror stuff. And it's not that different, but like, I don't love all the other Terror records as much. They're good. Terror's pretty consistent, but the early Todd Jones Terror to me is the best. And it's just like I, I don't know for sure that those are all his songs, but I'm pretty sure they're yeah, all his songs. Like, the, like the lowest of the low, and then uh, yeah, one yeah. with the underdogs. Yeah, yeah, those sound totally different. The four song demo. Oh, it's so sick. Gold. Yeah. So before we um, out. spend the rest of this episode talking about other bands, because we'll do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna, I thought that's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I'm going to divert here back to Some Days Are Darker. Um, sure. So you guys started as just a solo project then, and today how many people are in the band? Three today, yeah. Three today, okay. Yeah, we play as a three-piece now. Yeah, and... Um, Basically what happened was uh, Chris Martin, who is uh, the bassist in Some Days Are Darker, is also an engineer and he does a lot of uh, recording and stuff from home and production. So when I first started working on this, I started working with him because uh, he also worked on my previous band, um, Evolution of the Kill. And he also worked on the Kill Everyone record, actually. Right on. Uh, with us in various capacities because there are two recordings of that but so when i started some days are darker basically i i came to him and was like hey, i have these songs can you help me mix can you help me get something out and um we actually used a session drummer i played guitar and did vocals and then chris uh did bass and then engineered it and mixed it and so the first stuff came out was kind of like a uh we had guys from different states playing on it and it was kind of a singer songwriter project. I figured I was going to go play it solo. And then um, I got a drummer in Phoenix working with me, Brian Upton, who was a, the drummer in a band I played in here called the Iris. And they were like a goth rock band from Phoenix that did a couple records. And uh, I started working with Brian. So I thought, okay, this is cool. Like I have a drummer now, this can be more of a thing. We were going to kind of do it like a two piece. And so we went in to record the record. We did the LP. Uh, but when I did the LP, I wanted to go to a proper studio in Phoenix. So I started looking around for studios and it turns out there was a studio in downtown Phoenix, like around the corner from my apartment that I didn't know about. So I hit those guys up and this guy, Robbie Williamson replies to my email and says, Hey, yeah, if you want to track your drums, come on over. And I figured he was just going to track drums and I would give everything to Chris and Chris would take over. So I went down to the studio and, um, Robbie does this thing that he calls like a vibe check, which is like, he has you just come in for an hour 
and you just sit and hang out and talk about your project and what you want to do. So he could see if it's cool. a good fit and like if he understands what you want to do and if you know um, what it's going to be like to work together and things. So I think a lot of bad there. albums could have been saved by. Doing yeah, that. no shit. That's like a fucking great yeah. idea. Just yeah, to see if you guys are going to kind of like flow together or not, you know? Yeah. And if he thinks he could be successful on it based on what you're asking for, you know? And because, um, as you know, creative creatives coming together to work on things is super difficult, you know? So yeah, not, um, not everybody has the same end goal or vision. So there might be some clash there. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of artists are like really holding the bag tight, you know? They don't want to let anybody in. And right. So um, anyway, I sat down there with him and the first thing I noticed was he was wearing a black parade shirt and I was like, oh, this bodes well because I, I love MCR and I was just like, okay, cool. He's an MCR fan. He probably is like into some good music, whatever. And uh, so we started talking about bands and I said, did you listen to any of the material? And um, he goes, yeah, I, I listened to a few, a few songs last night and uh, kind of reminds me of like Interpol. And then he rattled off a couple other bands, but it was the first time that anyone had ever like compared me to one of my actual influences musically. And I just, it was just like, it was the simplest thing, but just in that moment, I knew he completely understood what I was trying to do musically. Um, and I was like, really what song? And we start talking about take me anywhere and, and restless tides, I think was one of them that he mentioned that sounded kind of like Leif Erikson. Um, so anyway, we ended up working with Robbie to do, uh, the record. And then the more I got to know Robbie, the more involved he became. And we ended up having him mix the whole record. And then by the end of the recording session, uh, my drummer, Brian basically admitted that he wasn't, he didn't have the time and he didn't want to keep doing it. And he also, uh, works sound. He does front of house at a venue here. So all his work nights are the exact nights that you want to be playing shows. Right. Um, so that that's how Robbie became our drummer. Yeah. It was like Brian left and then now Robbie had worked on everything. Plus he's a drummer and it was like, great. Can you fucking play drums for us? It is cool so, how things work out that way though, isn't it? You yeah. know, it's kind of like meant to be, if you will. I mean, if you were going to have a fill a in, like I feel like he was probably the best fit since he was already somewhat associated with the band. It's not like you were pulling in some dude auditioning off the street. Yeah. And man, drummers are so hard to find for me. Like I spent years trying to find drummers and, you know, I, I was kind of like pulling Brian in against his will. He enjoyed doing it with me because we're good friends. We have similar music tastes, but I always knew that like he wasn't trying to do a band full time. So I, I knew it was limited. So yeah, it all kind of just fell into place that way with Robbie and Chris. And so um, now I basically have two engineers in my band and uh, yeah that's what we're working with now as a three piece. So you guys put out a single this year. Do you have plans to put out an EP or a full record this year by chance, or is that coming down the road next year? Probably. Yeah, no, that's um, a lot of cool shit has happened this summer. And uh, one of the things that happened is um, we're going to be recording with Dave catching at Rancho de la Luna. You guys know that studio out in Joshua tree. This oh, is like, yeah, where, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know what you're talking like, about now. Where the desert sessions were done and all the Queens of the Stone Age stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. The new Iggy Pop record was done out there. Um, Arctic Monkeys, uh, PJ Harvey. They've done a lot of cool shit. Actually, if, uh, well, there's two. There's, a, there's an Anthony Bourdain episode where he goes to Rancho de la Luna and hangs out with like Josh, Hami, and, and Dave and all those guys. Super cool. old. It's like, it's like 720p, but it's on YouTube. You can find it. Um, and if you ever saw that kind of cringe Foo Fighters show they did where they like wrote a song every episode. Hey, I, like, I watched that where they toured to every studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they There's, went there. Yeah. They went to Rancho on one of them. So. Yeah, uh, Sonic Highways, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sonic Highways. Like they went Great to show. Steve I like usually the Steve like Albini to... episode. It was like real yeah. fucking cool. Well, I love all the episodes. I just turn it off when they do the song at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I just, I just, it's not for me. Yeah, um, not my thing either, man. So yeah, we're we're going out there to record with Dave. I think this October, um, and so we have released. Uh, we put out 
a single called Downpour in last fall, October. And then we put out Obsession on Valentine's Day. And we just put out Dead Romance um, in June, I think June 16th, 14th, something like that. Yeah. So I have to look at my Apple Music, but I know it was recent, yeah. semi recently. Yeah. So we put out three singles, and I always up to now thought those three singles would be on the next LP. But we produced that ourselves our own way at Robbie's studio, Orange Blossom in Phoenix. And so the, those songs that we have done, um, we have a new single that was going to be the next one called Oblivion. And we also tracked a cover of Protect Me From What I Want by Placebo. Okay. Shit, I haven't heard uh, that band in forever. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been playing that live now which it's it's been cool we've worked it out and uh so we have the three singles out and we're sitting on two more but i just realized within the past week or so that the production is probably not going to match now that we're going out to rancho to do another batch of songs so we'll be putting all those songs i just mentioned out as like a five song ep this fall and then just recording the the whole other record at that studio yeah then we're going to do a full length at rancho in the end of October. So that'll likely be out, you know, with the whole cycle and everything probably by spring or maybe a bit later, spring or summer okay. of 25. Definitely yeah. looking forward That's... to that EP, man. I like the new song, um, the dead romance song. Oh, thanks man. Yeah. Appreciate that. What, yeah, what was your that. inspiration on the lyrics with that? <laughs> uh, there's, it kind of all goes back to my divorce actually that one. Yeah. My first marriage. Brutal. He's a husband yeah. too. Husband. That's our new yeah. term on the show. Oh fuck! Are Jeremy, you guys also? Jeremy introduced it. It's no, horrible. I've, I've never been we married. Need to stop, need to stop oh yeah. It. <laughs> no, me neither. Me neither. Divorcees. Yeah, it was interesting getting divorced. At first, it was like I had trouble with the concept of being divorced and uh, feeling like you, you know, kind of broke some oath or that you, you know, couldn't, couldn't. Um, you know, keep a promise to somebody, you know, marriage is kind of like the ultimate lifelong For promise. Sure. And, uh, I had, I had a lot of, I struggled with that at first. And then I just kind of realized that we're both just better off and that it's just a pretty normal part of life that people go through. And I think like yeah. identifying as divorced is weird because it's like, if I see a checklist that says, are you single married or divorced? I'm like, why the fuck would I check divorce? Yeah, I'm, you're single. I'm just put single. Like, what? Yeah, I've never understood that either. That like, <laughs> is there something that they like? Oh, he's divorced. Red flag. Like, right. That sort like, of what thing. does it matter? Because it should be, if you're single, That's or sometimes you see separated or whatever. Like, bring that up to our next city council. Meeting. I think it only applies to taxes. Really, <laughs> it shouldn't apply for anything else. Like, it shouldn't it matter never made taxes sense. either. Well, it shouldn't, but I'm saying if you had to joint file or whatever, like, that's, we're not yeah. here to talk taxes. I'm not sorry, a fucking sorry. accountant. <laughs> <laughs> we're taking a weird segue. I feel like that's my fault. Yeah. But, uh, that yeah. Happens. No, so, but I was just, I just meant, like, the, um, that song, it definitely sounds like a hymn song or a hymn esque style song with that, like, dark, well, it's dead romance, a dark sound and some, you know, you sound like painful misery, but, like, at the same time super catchy yeah thanks dude it's like um yeah musically you know it's kind of rolling a few things together i actually had those guitar parts for a long time like well before i had written most of that song well before i knew i was going to do this band some days are darker um it was just something i had kind of been sitting on and then uh when we started working through new singles it kind of came out and then once robbie got attached to it originally it was going to be um a lot more down tempo it was just like a singer songwriter type thing and then when robbie got a hold of it he's like hey man i think this thing needs to be like double time what you're playing it and i'm like no shit okay let's hear it and so he put that like driving beat behind it and then that kind of caused the guitar parts to evolve into some of the more like a little bit like you know new order or joy division style like single note stuff yeah rather just like acoustic strumming Right. Um, so that and that's kind really, of what really Robbie evolved, does. Like he, that's cool. Yeah, he just kind of like as a producer, he just kind of injects that life or that like fresh perspective into my stuff. So I've really enjoyed working with him in that way. And then uh, 
intentionally went in and like put more synths on it than we have in the past. Like when I was, when I had a more stripped down band or thought it was going to be solo, it was sort of like, I was kind of averse to using any programming or synths or things. But now that we're a band and we can perform and we have, you know, a little bit of backing to fill it in. Um, we've been kind of going back. I have a SH 101 and some old um, Roland uh, analog synths I, that I bought because they were specifically the ones that the cure used on like faith and some of those records. So we've been kind of intentionally adding a little bit more of that sound in. So kind of trying to find that like balance between post-punk and dark wave. So you're like kind of like a gear nerd too. Yeah. Big time. Awesome. I feel like in, if you're doing Gothic music, that's electronic in any way, you have to be a gear nerd. No. Yeah, I know. It's just like when you, you know, you're like, I got some old rolling analogs, the ones they actually used on, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, uh, yeah. it's hard to find. Too. Yeah, I know. I got to go down that path. I went on eBay and was like, like looking for, a, well, actually it was Reverb, I think ultimately, but yeah, I was finding like a, a store in Japan that refurbs and sells um, like early eighties analog synths, shipped it, it is mint. That's and the crazy. price was not as bad as you would think. Even the SH 101 I got, I was very surprised at the price. So I had to grab it because they're usually like dramatically overpriced. So that was a yeah. That's that was one, a big that's one, one of those things where guys, like, like the name alone drives a price tag. Yeah, I I uh, yeah. I just like playing with those things uh, digitally. You know what I mean? Instead of like, I don't have any actual um, analog synths. You know, like you said, the stuff can get pricey, but fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah. You got I love I like the analog workflow a lot. Like I don't I don't enjoy digging through synths and patches and shit like that. Like it's right. not for me, but I, I really do like an analog synth workflow. I like the idea that you can just grab it and like, we'll sit there in the studio and just be passing it between me and Robbie. And we're just, you know, what about this? Cause any sound you make, you have to dial it in on the spot. Right. And when you plug it in, it's still that sound until you fuck with it again. So like, we'll just kind of be passing it back and forth and trying out sounds and shit like that. And it, it really does like so much add. fun to the creative process yeah well i feel like having that you know actually in front of you it doesn't really box you in but it gives you you know the sound that it's going to put out so you know like what you're looking for whereas if you have a computer and you're running some type of software that has you know eighteen thousand synth plugins it's almost overwhelming because you're like well i could go with this sound this sound this sound so you're more like on one direct path with the actual instrument in front of you. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more boring to me than sitting in a DAW and like toggling through each patch. Yeah. Like, you're what just is this, running what is your this? finger across the keyboard, seeing what noise it makes type of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's fucking so boring to me. So yeah, being able to kind of like craft and dial in the sound that's in your head makes a lot more sense for my workflow anyway. So, for shows, I know you're playing Blackout Barbecue this upcoming weekend. Um, yeah. Aside from that, what do you guys have coming up? Because I, I think you said you're traveling out of country here soon, aren't you? Yeah. Well, we just did uh, we just did a little run of Detroit, Windsor, and Toronto um, a couple weeks ago. That was nice. Those are some good shows. And then yeah, uh, Ramona wanted to get us on Blackout Barbecue, but it was a little too late. So I'm gonna do an acoustic set this oh, friday right. it's, yeah, right it's an all acoustic yeah. thing yeah yeah i'm gonna do an acoustic set friday on the patio um and then right now because i'm right in the middle of this move to new york and everything um there's just a lot of logistical bullshit going on in my life so we're looking at um october november to do some more u.s stuff um, and it's just going to depend on which week we're at Rancho and then what other stuff we can work around. So technically nothing else until, um, the only thing we have solid on the calendar right now is we'll be at the, um, black Christmas. Okay. okay. Yeah. We'll be doing black Christmas on the 30th. I think it is this year. And, um, we'll be doing that as like a full band show. Yeah. I haven't seen Aside from like you just saying that, I've, I've talked to Ramona about it. I know we're going to have her back on and talk to her with it. 
Nice. Or about yeah, we that. haven't made it to Christmas yet. Yeah. Christmas yeah. is like <laughs> usually hard for me to get down there cuz yeah. it's just such like a busy time. Yeah, I was there last year and it was a great time. I just saw so many people I hadn't seen. I, I was there I last you year were, too. I was going to say I thought you were there last year. I was. Year. Yeah. So it was Did good to COVID? see you. Did I get COVID? <laughs> it was good to see you. No. So many people I know got sick after that show. No. I got sick that week too. Yeah. Probably just because of the influx of people being crowded together or they're sharing drinks. I don't know. Yeah. Or both. Yeah. But yeah, that was a great show. Um, so that's the only thing permanent on the calendar right now, but um, we've got a bunch of stuff in the works. So just nothing I can announce yet. Yeah. So before yeah. we started recording, we were talking about some of your previous bands and they were more in like kind of the hardcore punk type of realm. How did yeah. you make the transition from that style to like the goth rock that you're doing now? Was it uh, just simply out of your love of Sisters of Mercy, Depeche Mode and that sort of thing? Or was there something that like drove you? It, you know, that's always been there. And like as a songwriter, there's, you know, tons of songs that I write and never put out. And even um, when I was like in Face Down, for example, writing just like metalcore and mosh parts there's always like other songs like acoustic songs or fucking i'm screwing around with something else in the background that's a totally different style so i've kind of had like side projects and little offshoots and things that didn't go anywhere but i think the main thing that happened was uh i had done like a few hardcore bands because i did counterfeit first face down then it's all gone to hell for a little bit and then uh I, like I was in it for a little bit, but a year or two of their stretch. And then, uh, did you just play guitar and it's all gone to hell, right? Yeah. Yeah. When hasty stepped out, I, I was second guitar and then I did kill everyone real briefly. So then after that, I started this other project called evolution of the kill. That was more like melodic vocal over metalcore kind of thing. Like, I don't think they existed yet, but if I had to compare it to something now, it's like kind of similar to early Bring Me the Horizon type sound, where it's like a alternative vocal over metal or something. Gotcha. Um, it's a very like then, 2000s era thing. Very, there very, was yeah. every band that did that for a minute. Yeah, and I think it was like 06 to 08 that I worked on that record, and then anyway just to wrap that up i had done like 10 or 12 years at that point of just heavy music and i was like really really bored of playing to metal crowds almost like frustrated by it because it was like the goal was always just to like fire up the metal crowd it was like the more violent you could make everyone be and the more everyone's hitting each other or jumping off the stage or whatever then the more success you have but I got just really burned out on like writing songs, thinking about how people were going to react to it live. And then you go and play live and you see like, oh, that song, everyone just stands there. This song, everyone goes crazy. So then as a, as a writer, you start always trying to write something that's going to make everyone go crazy. Yeah. And I got really bored of that. And what I realized is that like at all our shows, dudes were all fired up hitting each other and shit and girls were just kind of standing around. And I was like, for the next record, I want to make songs that everyone in this room can enjoy. I want to make songs that like, instead of just dudes punching each other, I would like to see girls dancing. I would like to see people just like moving and, you know, having a good time instead of just like fucking each other up. Cause I've, I've been making people fuck each other up for a long time. So, uh, so Evolution the Kill had a severe evolution of the first record is heavy as fuck and the second record is almost like alternative or something um almost like uh and the in the second lp that was the first record to the ep and the the last lp we did was almost like um post-punk revival influence and there was some more electronics in there and some more programming and a little bit a little bit of depeche mode creeped in and so once that once i quit that then i did this band uh in phoenix called the iris which is basically my friend 
Brandon Dooley's band. He was the primary songwriter in that, but I just jumped in and played second guitar with him. So I spent about a year playing all these goth rock shows and playing the Iris music with Brandon. And then it was just felt kind of natural progression after that, that when I started doing some days or darker, it was like, okay, I'm here now, you know? And like, as much as I would love to do another heavy band again, and I would, I would love to do a band that I'm not the singer of, cause I've been the singer of like the last three or four bands, uh, being just playing guitar in a heavy band would be super fun. I, I'd love to do that again. But, um, yeah, this, this just felt like, you know, coming through all of those, transformations this was just like kind of the natural path and for everybody out there listening he has been to our hometown of Alpina and has played shows here in our little hometown so that's pretty cool man yeah we learned that okay. beforehand so that was yeah you said that was quite a while ago then in like 99, yeah, that was 99 2000? 2000 it would have been around that area yeah because i think i was in face down from 99 to 01 or 02 I yeah think. You guys would have played with um, Witness to an End would have been another band around that time, I think. Yeah, maybe. We I think I saw I you remember. guys play with that band up here when okay. I was, like, young. 15, yeah, 16. You, it would have been, like, my second or third show, actually. In Grain, you said, too, right? Yeah, that was before my time. Oh, that okay. Was, that was a couple okay. years before me. Yeah, because that was like man, I wish I could remember the names of those guys. 96, demo, 97, yeah. 98, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's even that's even early for me. And yeah, because I, I was doing Counterfeit in like '97. Yeah, that, and, that's uh, that's another band, man. That's crazy. Yeah, and we, this is funny. So, Chris Rawson from Stick to Your Guns was also in Walls of Jericho. It's all gone to hell. Yep. Our first band together in high school was counterfeit and when i joined it was like chris's band he was mainly the songwriter and uh he said my goal with this band is to open for earth mover at the shelter fucking awesome and so we were like okay that's our goal let's do it so we played all these shitty shows and we just started like meeting other cool hardcore bands and like other kids around and the windsor steam scene was kind of like that wave of hardcore was developing like the late nineties wave into the early turn of the century. And, um, I think it was within the first year we got, we opened for earth mover at the shelter and Ramona booked it, which comes full circle because That's awesome. yeah, so sure Ramona, you're, you're booking in the last, now. yeah, Ramona just became, you know, we just started working with her again. Uh, to as a booker for some days of darker so that whole thing kind of came full circle i mean it's like 20 plus years of just bands and shows and the hardcore scene is just still what's connecting everybody even now in our 40s yeah, yeah. no isn't it crazy and remote is the one bringing everybody together for it yeah still oh, yeah. still yeah so, it's I'm, I'm sure she'll listen to this so shout out to ramona for sure yeah love you ramona so what was it if you remember what was it like playing up here versus like the Detroit area? Cause I was, I was way too young to be at the show here. So. Oh yeah. Um, well, when we played Detroit, it always felt like, first of all, like Detroit is one of the greatest cities to play. I think Detroit is like, I always say about Detroit that whatever you're into in Detroit, you're really into like people in Detroit are no bullshit and they're very passionate about what they're into. Yeah. Whereas like, there's a lot of other cities that you play and people are like, you know, too cool or they're too calm or they just want to stand there with their arms crossed or whatever. But it was never that way in Detroit, man. We'd always make friends with everybody. There was always just great energy at the shows. And I think Detroit also had for us and our whole region, Windsor and everything else, the most legit like venues. Like playing the shelter when I was 17 was like, wow, this is like a real venue. They have a sound guy. There's a fucking doorman there's like a bar <laughs> in windsor we used to play at the fucking gino marcus that was a hall that we booked for like 150 bucks and it was just an empty room we had to bring our own pa it was like totally just cobbled together um but that was also like some of the charm of early hardcore right and i remember alpina being like windsor it, it was like very diy it was like the like bands putting their own shows together 
and that kind of thing. Like, I don't think there was any bookers or like proper venues, right? It would have been in like yeah, it was just in a rental um, hall or something. Yeah, like there's Wilson Township Hall, Sanborn Hall. I yeah. saw you guys play at. Um, yeah, shit that we would book Preskill, and then like what yeah. would happen up here? It'd be like something would happen to where like maybe the place somebody left some trash or some some old person drove by and was like there's a bunch of a bunch of people hooligans. out there hooligans and tattoos and <laughs> acting crazy loud music and then they get shut down and, yeah. and to the point where it was like you know oh, i'm having a birthday party oh you already tried that here that's not going to work again you know like it's just, oh yeah so yeah it's like trying to book bad luck 13 they yeah, have to keep just, changing their name every show right yeah so i remember it being like very DIY, very cool, like hyper local. I remember it being like a few really cool bands from up there that we became good friends with and we traded shows with. And yeah, and I, I remember Alpina kids coming down to all the Detroit shows. And I was like, oh good, you know, Alpina's here. It was like, everyone was traveling from their little, little, you know, small towns to come to like good shows. And yeah, we, cool. we felt the same way because we're from Windsor. It's just a bullshit little town. But we all kind of had Detroit to like connect us, I think, in that in that region. Yeah, it amazes me how many people know about Alpina, just in general. Because us being from here, like we just see it as this little like tiny ass speck on the map that really nobody knows. But I've been to a lot of shows where you meet people, talk to them, they ask you where you're from, and they're like, "Oh, I go there for this, that, or the other." Like. Or I seen a show there like 20 years ago, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's wild yeah. though, because there's and like virtually there none time. of that here now. I mean, I guess kind of, but not like what I'd be into. Like we just had LA Guns play here like a week ago or something, which I'm not into LA Guns, but cool that they came here. Did you go? No. Yeah. Nah, I missed that. That's a weird one, man. Very yeah. weird one. They played at, so there's like a festival here called the Brown Trout Festival every year. It's like a big fishing festival. Okay. It used to be a lot bigger, and now I feel like it's kind of just dwindled down into it just this pale imitation of what it was. But I'm just like amazed so that they got L.A. Guns to play there because they, at one point, were a big band. And yeah. Clearly, that's not working out quite as well for them now <laughs> yeah, i wonder what they did get paid for that just that i'm like you know morbid curiosity um i heard like 30k or something like that Shit, really yeah yeah and i think that's why those legacy bands still still get those gigs because uh there's a place in phoenix called verado it's like a master plan like a small town out in buckeye and uh they do a annual festival every year and they always book like a huge band. Um, and it's a lot of times like late in the career band. Like I think the first band they booked there was like B-52s. But they've done like... Uh, they brought out Rock did, uh, I'd totally like, go to that, dude. Dude, yeah. At like at the small town festival kind of thing. And uh, it gets packed. Like they pack in the whole area where like... I don't know what the capacity of that lawn would be. But it's jam-packed every year with whatever band they have. They've had a lot of like... 80s legacy bands and uh anyway a couple years ago they had vince neal and it was vince neal like you know with his no one from miley crew it was just like you know some other la oh, dudes man. was and, it actually uh, vince neal or was it like roseanne Barr dressed up in a wig or something because you can dude, mistake the two <laughs> it was it was something this is doppelganger did you go man. you went to it uh, so because, uh, for work, I do a lot of video work. I was able to get a uh, press pass and I was, able, you know, they let you shoot like one song or 10 minutes or whatever. So yeah, I went because I knew Vince Neil was going to like completely make a fool out of himself. And I just wanted to like be really close and like, see what the fuck was going to happen. So <laughs> I, I, I filmed and, uh, it was a catastrophe like i'm sure you've seen i don't know how much shit i I've, should talk on your I've show seen but like some ah oh shit i don't care vince neil doesn't i doubt he listens to this and if he does fuck him so um <laughs> all i would say is dude like yeah and if I he, know... he should be in in my opinion he should be in jail i'm done i was yeah, gonna kill like, the guy yep this shit, it was 
the most embarrassing show I've seen by far. There was a point where he just left the stage. He played a few songs had and he's you know, had like a rock star. I got to hit my oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. He did. Like he, he did like three or four terrible songs, you know, which is like the worst vocals you've ever heard. And then ran away. And yeah, he looked like, you know, Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, like cruising around out there. Oh, man. And then he goes backstage and fucking doesn't come back. So his band is all like, yeah, all right. So they just take over and start doing like covers. They're doing like Zeppelin tunes and ACDC and shit. And his band ripped. They're fucking great. He had a great drummer. Uh, both his guitar and basses could sing well. They're, you know, as just like, like a, fuck him. These guys kick yeah. ass. And they got a huge crowd there that is just waiting. You know, they played, I think, three songs before Vince Neil came back. And Man. I'm 99% sure that was not rehearsed. It was just like, fuck, we've got to fill the air. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he comes running back out and it's like, oh, okay, well, and they play a few more songs, dude. It was so fucking weird. Yeah, the promoter's but, like, get your ass back up there. I'm not fucking paying you for three songs and, that you did. And I know you said 30K. Like, yeah. I, I think the pay for that, would, as far as I know, was upwards of that and yeah. for one gig. And so it's like, I get why they go out and do it. But at the same time, it's like, man... Motley Crue has such a good legacy and like the more you do that the worse you just yeah. fucking your own legacy you know like yeah. some people just need to know when to stop I get it like okay so I could understand because if somebody was like hey Ryan and Jeremy will pay you $30,000 to come here and talk I doubt that'll happen but you know never fucking know I'm right here I would go do it no <laughs> matter what it was um, like yeah. I wouldn't care if you were like, yeah, you're going to cover a Miley Cyrus event or something like I would do it. So yeah. I get why they do it. But yeah, yeah, when it, when you have a legacy of music, that's a different thing because you're, yeah, like we you don't said, have a legacy to defend yet. Exactly. There's like, no shame did, yeah. in our game. Dude. They're just like, oh, you're, you're still you're building your legacy from yeah. a record store, like, you know, yeah. whatever. But I, I just wouldn't want to shit on my whole career like that, like especially in Vince Neil's case, because it's just literally embarrassing. Like there's guys that go out there and do it and do it well still. Like people's Rolling Stones still sell out. Um, yeah. I'm not saying they're doing it the best, but at their age, they're doing it. But it's not embarrassing. Yeah. Like yeah. the Vince Neil thing, that was, and Axl Rose had it happen too. Like they had, Terrible. it was a couple of years there where those clips were like circulating the internet that were just awful. And I, like, mean, I would try to, if it were me, I'd be like, somebody take that shit down, like find your agent, oh. get it to take it off. Cause it, it was embarrassing. I don't know if as an artist, you ever know when you're done and you should give up. You're like, I think that would take a lot of self-awareness maybe more than most people have including myself i don't know if i should be still going or if i should be quite you know what i mean it's like i think i still have something to offer but um in our opinion you should keep going thank you for um, now one of the things like <laughs> <laughs> yeah for now let me know when it becomes fucking embarrassing <laughs> but uh when when we were in the van you know we in the van we have some of the best conversations because you know, of course like Chris and Robbie and I are just enormous music nerds, like lifetime musicians. We've all been playing since we were little kids. We've all had bands since we were in our teens. So when the three of us get together, you know, we just riff on like the weirdest shit. And um, one of the topics that came up was like bands that tour as like the band has broken up into two bands, but now you go see it and it's like Vince Neil's Motley Crue. And then it's like the real Motley Crue and that kind of shit. I that wondered about that you. with the L.A. Guns show because that right. happened at one time where there was, like, Tracy was going off and then yeah. the rest of the band was going off and it was, like, they were both L.A. Guns. Yeah, well, that happened yeah. with, like, Jack Starr's Burning Star and, like, I think either Great White or White Snake had that happen and, like, a lot of those 80s yeah. bands had yeah. that shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just fucking weird. Actually, I saw... So I was at Beyond the Gates last week and... um in Norway and I saw Venom nice. and it ripped. But I wanna say that they were not Venom. They're like Yeah, they're like too old. The real Venom or Venom something. Like I feel like they Isn't have a tagged Venom, on word. Venom Inc. Wasn't that a thing for a minute or something like that? Yeah, because I think they've had some like lineup disputes. Yeah. 
Um, but it was fucking great. But uh, I think they might be doing the, um, yeah. And then there's a lot of those, like, I, ju- I just feel like there's certain genres that don't really stand the test of time. And I think like, or certain 80s albums are, too, for sure. That might've been great at the time that you listen to now. And you're like, this is tacky. Like, but like eighties hair metal, cocaine and hairspray and like skinny dudes in women's clothes hanging out in Hollywood with bandanas around their feet and stuff like that had a time, but like, you can't do that forever. Yeah. So I feel like you just let that steel Panther and you're making it. You know what I mean? Like you can't really do that in your sixties. Like, okay. The stones can still be the stones, but like when I see um, like pop punk bands, like newfound glory or something doing like they're 45, and they're doing and like high school songs. They're doing high school songs. Yeah, it's with fucked like, up. With like a whiny little voice. I'm just like, I don't know, man. I feel like now that you're in your forties, like maybe you should Write evolve something the music else. Yeah. That's no, more I'm, like I'm age you. appropriate, you know, and like leave the pop punk for like kids. You sing about high school and having a crush on someone for the first time and shit like that. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> no, man, you're totally you know I, mean? like, I totally agree. The age of their dad. I get in um, <laughs> I was I've had this conversation with a you know another friend where I was like complaining about some some band about having a whiny voice and he's like, dude, I think you just don't like pop punk. And I'm like Yeah, I, I don't think I do, man. You, you know, you like don't. there's only a few we've gone we've gone over. There's this only like a few of times. a few bands, but it's like, yeah, yeah. Like you said, it's I, like there's something about they don't evolve out of like that like that's perfect, like the crush thing. Like Yeah. We have kids. We've been through divorces. We've lived life, dude. We're kind of past the fucking skipping school and, like, you know, yeah. smoking a joint in the back and getting a crush on a girlfriend and getting beat up by the football player, whatever it is. You <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. It's like, anyway. I, I think even Blink is still kind of like that in a lot of ways. Like, I think yeah. their self titled record, the greatest thing about it was that it kind of matured them. Right. But, like, to have them still like going around playing songs about like, I don't know, pissing their pants or whatever the fuck. It just, it's kind of weird. Like not, nothing against the records. I think the records hold true. You could always go back and listen to those records, but like seeing a bunch of dudes that are like pushing 60 doing some of those songs, it just gets kind of weird. Yeah. Whereas like well, now when they're singing, what's my age again, it's cause they forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, it's like fucking dementia. But, uh, Oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Was... <laughs> my bad. <laughs> uh, it's fine. Oh, I was going to say, um, I do think there's other genres that, like, you can kind of do forever. Like, you can't age out of doom, right? Because, yeah. I out mean, of the blues. lyrically, it's yeah, not... Yeah, you can't age out of the blues. There's no age to it, lyrically. Like, you're not dating yourself in a certain period. Yeah. Or, I mean, not period, age group. So, like, seeing Venom... And they're like 65. It was fucking great. It was like seeing Motorhead. It was like That's the dope. older the older Motorhead got. There's just like the fucking better it was. It was just fucking great. They were Motorhead and they were never gonna die, you know. Yeah. That's a band that I'm glad you said I, that and yeah, didn't yeah, say was, the other because I'm like so many people for Motorhead, they're like cut off as ace of spades and they're like, they didn't do anything after that. And I'm what like, dude, what's wrong with you? Some of their best albums were after that. I mean, to me, Motorhead's like ACDC. It's like if you like one record, then you, you probably you like all, the rest all of them. Yeah. It's like it's like Hatebreed. Agreed. If you, if you like one, yeah, they just do the same thing very well forever. So yeah, they found they found out. their niche and stuck with it. Bolt Thrower did it until the the end of their fucking you know run there. So and they did it well. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what did you think uh, also, of? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say also. Uh, a tough like playing bolt thrower as you age can't be easy right that's like very intense music to keep going yeah oh yeah, yeah. And dexterity and stuff i don't know, man. i seen cannibal yeah. corpse not that long ago and i watched corpse grinder like windmill headbang for two minutes straight and i was just like how did he not fall over like it's it's nuts like and he's in his 50s like not that yeah. that's like ancient or anything but it's not like he's a young man anymore well, oh, yeah. I, get, I get how, I mean, you know, um, obviously you play guitar, so Keith Richards just does, like, all his open tunings to make it easy. Yeah. But it's like, 
But yeah, like trying to play like some shredding fucking technical metal at like 70 with arthritis yeah. while you're like Ugh. your dexterity is all fucked yeah, up. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe it's time to play the blues. And especially the vocal, man, like like bolt thrower vocal, you know, that oh, that's yeah, not it's easy gotta, to like, do. got to just fucking destroy your yeah. shit. Yeah. So Some of those guys long term, I think if they like if they had the right training, the longevity can be there if they don't destroy their voice. But a lot of them, so many of them, like Chris Barnes is a good example. Like his latest yeah. stuff is kind of rough because, I mean, yeah, he's probably like tore the voice. shit out of his voice. Yeah. Yeah. It's like something. And that's what to me, like we talked about Vince Neal and some of those guys like that trying to hit that range forever and trying to hit that range when you're older and you know your health is declining and shit that's super hard like axel rose range yeah. super hard range to especially hit. especially if you're already out of breath when you're going into that and you're trying to <laughs> you're trying to reach that octave but yeah. you're like down yeah. here but i will say yeah. man think about it on a on a mental on your mental state like you're saying from the singer's point of view let's say they were a basketball player let's say they, whatever they were good at and then they age yeah. and then they got to let go of that that's got to be fucking hard, man. Cause that, you Especially know, it's like you're super famous and you're super yeah. right. Yeah. It's, it's gotta be difficult. I know it must be so fucking depressing, honestly. Yeah. Cause I mean, it would be within you to keep creating. And yeah. I, un I always understand that like about, you know, people that are in their seventies, eighties, whatever, like they're going to still create until they're done. But it's just not all of Here's it works. Here's a good example that it worked. Johnny Cash, whole life. Country, you can grow and you can be 20 and you can be 80 and yeah. it works. Buddy Guy would be another one. Yeah. Well, motherfuckers we'll see, like, like, the blues, motherfuckers you like know? 90 yeah. and he's still doing it. You know what yeah. I think is, is actually an interesting one is uh, I think Depeche Mode has aged very well. Their, oh, latest, I would agree. their latest album was really good. Tears for and, Fears is another one. They can do all their vocals live, you know. Their vocals are fucking great live. Uh, they can still, you know, but they're they can well still trained that sound musicians. Up. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. that isn't always the case. Like in Venom's case, I'm sure. Like you know, they've been doing it forever. But were they like yeah. studio musicians? Like how Tears for Fears and etc. were? I don't yeah. really think so. They were just kind of yeah. doing what they were doing, jamming, and then yeah. it worked at the time. And then they made their legacy. For sure. Black metal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, uh, the genre, like the style of music really can be a make or break, you yeah, know? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So before we wrap this up, because I could sit and talk about this shit all day. Same um, with me. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you guys are going to kick. Stop talking and get the fuck out. We go. We'll go on tangents. Uh, like oh, this man. I just day. need this bathroom breaks. Do. I'll be good. <laughs> hey, do you guys? Before, I know you're going to queue up something here, but do you guys have. So, did you say you have a record store? Yeah. We're in the back of it right now. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Okay. Can I send you guys some records? Yeah. You most definitely I'll, can, um, sir. I'll message you on sure. Instagram afterwards. Hell yeah. Are you guys on Discogs? Yep. Okay, cool. I'm going to, I'll find you on there so I could shop your store. Okay. Because we have a. Uh, if you shop yeah. the podcast name, is the, our Discogs store, yeah. which is mostly just new things right now because I, I don't have all the used stuff in the store up here. Okay. Right on. Yeah. Because we have a, we have an LP, the self titled LP on Coke Bottle Clear. Okay. And I have Sick. Some I have some copies of that I could send up to you guys, like for you and maybe to put in the store or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we also have, uh, I sold all the Lost Days. We did a short run of Lost Days on uh, I seen a clear. seven inch, wasn't it? Was yeah. that the seven inch? Yeah, it was yeah. a clear with pink label. We sold all those, but uh, we're doing um, Dead Romance. I just ordered a Dead Romance um with protect me from what i want on the back oh dope and we, should be, we should be getting those in a few weeks so when i get those i'd love to send some up to you guys as well definitely yeah i'll get awesome. you our mailing address and everything um i'll message you afterwards Much appreciate but it sir i yeah. did um before we asked junkie. the uh oh yeah we are too yeah before i ask the end of the episode question that we always ask is there anything you would like to add get off your chest plug promote anything like that I'll have all your info in the episode description. So, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Dead Romance is out now. That's the latest single. 
uh, for Some Days Are Darker. Also, the um, the videos on YouTube as well for Dead Romance. Um, we've got a new song called Oblivion coming out this fall, September-ish. Okay. Um, and then as soon as we figure out what the name of this EP will be, uh, we'll have a we'll have the EP coming out with that as well. So look for more updates coming soon. But I, I think I'm going to open up a um, pre-order for the Dead Romance Seven Inch okay. at SomedaysDarker.com. So cool. check that out too, and uh, all that stuff will be in our store at SomedaysDarker.com. Yeah, I'll put a link for that in the episode description. So anybody listening interested, go click that. Um, and the awesome. Hand, I'll throw you guys' Instagram in there. So follow them. Follow us if you're not. And of course, uh, the the backyard barbecue, the blackout barbecue uh, on Friday. Yeah, the acoustic. Friday in Detroit. And then Christmas yeah. coming up too, as well. Because yes. I know we're going to be talking to Ramona about that, promoting that. So we'll be sure to plug you guys again on yeah, that. Yeah, if you're in the Detroit area this Friday, man, for sure. Catch out the yeah. acoustic set. Yeah. But. With fear. Yeah, with fear. That's going to be so cool. And Guida. Um, I want to go, but I don't know that I'm going to be able to make it. So we always ask people at the end of our episodes, just because Jeremy and I are into all sorts of different music, um, outside of your genre of music that you play, what is something that you listen to that people wouldn't expect? Oh, yeah. I'm glad you asked this question. Um, My most prized bin of records is my soundtracks bin. Fuck yeah. Nice. Yeah, dude. like I'm very proud of my soundtrack vinyl collection. Actually, I, I kept my bin next next to me for this interview just in case that <laughs> oh, you we ended up. What's uh, let's out see on what vinyls. you got, dude? What's a couple of uh, your favorite I've, soundtracks? I've got some. I've got some great titles, uh, and I think like they, you know, because I love film. Um, and having great film soundtracks is almost like a list of my favorite movies and my favorite soundtracks at the same time. Yeah. Uh, do you guys know the film Angel Heart? Yep. From 1987? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I have an OG vinyl of that. Um, the Crash from 96. I remember the, that movie. Yeah. The Cronenberg yeah. film. Yep. Yeah. Um, I recently got that reissue of Crash, which is now that, great. the Angel Heart one, is that fuck? Who's. Is that all the, um, is that the score of it? Yeah. Yeah, that's sick. All right, cool. Yeah, it's the score, so it has, like, a lot of those blues tunes that yeah. you're in the bar. Um, it has the uh, Johnny Favorite and song. And that, like, New Orleans fucking yeah. grime to it. That's all that stuff. And then it has, like, uh, it, all between all the songs and weaving through everything, it has, like, dialogue and then, like, nice. some of the some of the actual like score underneath that. So it's like a, it's like a combo of, of dialogue score and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where it's like your soundtrack, I guess. Yeah. Like, mu- soundtracks uh, are usually like the band songs the and the score. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Music and It's kind of like yeah, Apocalypse yeah. Now soundtracks, kind of like that with the yeah. dialogue. With the little skits and then the yeah. fucking 12 Jimi Hendrix songs or whatever. Doors. Yeah. <laughs> or Doors, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's up there. Um, only lovers left alive soundtrack. It's epic. Yeah. Yeah. That's a Jim Jarmusch film, uh, with, uh, I'm it's a band film set in Detroit. Oh shit. Now yeah. I gotta, now I gotta watch it. What was it's the name with, of that? Uh, only Tom lovers Hiddleston left and, uh, the, um, only lovers left alive. Yeah. Right. I wrote it down. Um, that's a great one. It's got two sides. It has like the U.S. side. It has like Detroit and Tangier. So it's a double LP, and the first half is like a bunch of squirrel songs and stuff like that. Not and really. then the second half is like Tangier side. It's all like you know world music, and it go it gets like out there. Yeah, that one's awesome. super great. I'll definitely um, check that out. Cut me off at any time. Uh, the uh, Twin Peaks, the Return soundtrack. Oh, I don't. I have the original, but not the return. Yeah, I love the, that show, dude. The return's epic. It's a. It's like a comp. You know how they had all the bands. Like each episode, they'd have a band close yeah. out the show. So it has like Nine Inch Nails. It has like an Eddie Vedder tune. It has a great chromatics tune. Um, and then of course, like 
all the you know a bunch of the other cool stuff that lynch curated yeah. for it yeah that's sick Super cool. and then uh a lot of horror soundtracks like it follows i have the that have a, that's so scared dude that shit we were is just so talking about creepy that the dude. other day weren't i we? feel yeah the, i feel like that record mentally affects me dude when i listen to it like I, it's so sometimes fucked can't up. get through it yeah it's yeah. fucked up dude it's really fucked i'm up. glad i'm not the only one dude that thinks i'm just it's just so fucking gnarly uh i was in uh joshua tree and i found a like old 70s copy of psycho oh, that's fucking cool yeah that was a really good one and then uh there's one other nerdy one i'll show you guys uh if i could find it, it should be in here. oh it's in my it's in my other bin sorry of uh of recents i keep like you know the shit i'm listening to the most yeah out yeah, there, yeah for sure yeah i got an old pressing um like a first pressing of a possession soundtrack oh, okay the nice. horror flick possession. Yeah, yeah that shit's so fucking hard to come by dude where'd yeah, you find that at just out in the wild or uh I, a lot of that rare stuff i have to discogs yeah like yeah. it's mostly only in europe oh shit yeah we have quite a few soundtracks here but they're more like just oddity randoms like breakfast at tiffany's and uh like stuff like that like we don't get many horror soundtracks and i mean i'll order them new like from waxworks and stuff but yeah. as far as used we are not in the area that they were in abundance i've, yeah, I've snatched them, up yeah. a few but like yeah. escape from new york yeah shit like that i've um, seen apocalypse now come through here a handful but my of prized times, ones would be like stuff. terminators original Ooh. robocop original Ooh. Beetlejuice original. Damn. Those would be like my probably my top like three. My yeah. favorite soundtrack, Soundtracks. pretty much. Like as far as like vinyl fly. rarity, you know. But like my right. favorite, wait, I mean that's kind of hard. It is hard. But I'm just going off yeah. of my most listened to soundtrack ever, and it's got to be Superfly. I'm pretty sure I've never listened to a soundtrack more than that album. <laughs> that's Amazing. 110th Street, dude. That's another good one too. Yeah, so we're going to go on forever, bro. Yeah, but yeah. anyways, man, before we get sidetracked again, movies are like our, sure. the movies and music are hand in hand for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Just... thank, we thank you for your time and for getting on to talk with us, chatting, and uh, it's been cool. It was fucking yeah, surprising guys. that you've been up here to play in Alpina. That was awesome. That's why yeah. we love doing this, because we've, like... We're like, well, we don't know what to expect. We'll get to know the dude. And then you're like, oh, I've been here and played with this band, that band. Yeah, and I have, like, your albums in my collection and shit. Yeah. Like, it's <laughs> fucking wacky, dude. Yeah, when Ramona introduced me to you guys, I just thought, man, like, I feel like I already know these guys. We're going to talk for hours. Awesome, yeah. dude. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to do it again, man. We could just yeah, do and a I'd whole love to another, come up and see your shop. Another separate fucking yeah, absolutely. episode. Absolutely. If you sure. were ever coming up to Alpina, just get a hold of one of us ahead of time, and um, we'll definitely be around. And then if we make it down to Black Hot Barbecue or um, Black Christmas, uh, I'll get a yeah. hold of you in advance. Um, yeah, for sure. So we can meet up and say what's up. Yeah, man. Great talking with you guys. Yeah, you, you too, dude. man. You take care, Thanks and uh, I'll be in touch with you.